All right. So we're going to overview this, this dilemma in the United States called chronic kidney disease. Um, like broad overview today, okay? We're gonna rapid fire, like I said, introduction. So we, we won't really deep dive on anything unless you guys feel like it. Um, feel free to interject or, or ask questions or bring up a story or, or whatever as we're going through. But you know, here's, here's the deal. In the United States, um, chronic kidney disease, TKD, is affecting one in seven Americans, you know, somewhere like 14% or so of Americans have uh, chronic kidney disease. And that is uh, uh, what leads to like ESRD or end-stage renal disease where they need dialysis. So chronic kidney disease doesn't necessarily mean you need dialysis. There, there are stages to chronic kidney disease based off of tests that would be done from a doctor, um, mainly something called glomerular filtration rate or GFR that they use to stage uh, the, the, the level of kidney disease. So one through five are the stages and one, one is being very minor and five is being the, the most severe, what they call end stage. And like what the end stage really means is if you didn't if we, if you didn't have dialysis or transplant, it, it's the it is a terminal illness. It's gonna it's gonna lead to death. Um, and and how who knows? There are so many complications that come from kidney failure. Like your kidneys do a lot of stuff. So when they fail, like any one of those things that they do can kill you. Like then you make a combination, a cocktail of problems, right? And it's like, well, what am I going to die of today? <laughs> is it going to be a, a heart attack or a stroke? Or is it going to be uh, a hypotensive episode at dialysis that stops my heart? Or is my blood sugar going to be, you know, low because I'm trying to fool the doctor and make them think I'm controlling my blood sugar. So I end up having a seizure. Uh, you know, like there's a billion things that can happen um, related to kidney failure. And then it's like, what caused the kidney failure? Why are there so many people in the United States with one in, that like one in seven that have chronic kidney disease? Because type two diabetes and hypertension are um, like epidemic, right? Um, they, they, there is diagnosed. I, I'm going to be on the the conservative side. Conservative side um, over like 26 million in the United States. And then the pre-diabetic, and again, I'm gonna be conservative, uh, 70 million. So, you know, close to 100 million in that diabetic domain, right? Then you got hypertensives, that's like one in three Americans. So let's just, let's be, again, be conservative. Let's call it another 100 million. So, so between, type 2 diabetes and hypertension, there's over, over 200 million Americans suffering, right? Number one cause of chronic kidney disease is what? Diabetes. Type, yeah, type 2 diabetes. And th then the number two is high blood pressure or hypertension. So, so these, things, these things are driving this number, right? Can I can ask? something go ahead so i understand diabetes because diabetes when you have diabetes um it attacks your major organs uh, but how, how is hypertension causes uh, chronic kidney disease they both do the same thing really they damage blood vessels and nerves and oh, organs yes. so yeah. um yeah vascular damage uh, oh, okay Thing. And, then, and then when you look at, oh, excuse me, sorry guys. When you look at some of the common issues with type two diabetes, then you go like, well, hmm, a lot of type two diabetics go blind too. Yeah. Right. And then a lot of type two diabetics like end up with infection that they lose like toes 
or feet or legs, mm -hmm. right? Amputation. So diabetes is like one of the top 10 killers in the United States already. <coughs> um, hypertension is like a contributor to like the number one, which is heart disease. Right? And then some of the subtopic events like strokes and heart attacks. So, so when we say chronic kidney disease, one in seven Americans, yeah, like there's a good chunk of those people that are there, like no disrespect to anybody, including myself, but out of a choice, right? Like I, I went to the doctor and they told me I gained, you know, five pounds and I got to watch it, you know, because I'm not supposed to gain that much in a year. And then the next year I went back and I was, you know, 10 more. And doctor said, hey, you're you're like getting obese. And your blood sugar is high. Your A1C is high. You're pre-diabetic. And then the next year I go back and I didn't do anything about it. I gained 10 more pounds. Right? And and uh, my blood sugar is way out of control. Now I'm type 2 diabetic. So, so this is a scenario. That's one scenario. Is like knowingly continuing to walk to disease, right? But then there's another scenario of like never even knowing you have type 2 diabetes. Like typical Hispanic Latino man, they won't go to the doctor. They will not go to the doctor. And they will eat and drink what they want, right? That's like typical, stereotypical. But, but then when they end up going to the doctor, it's like when they're really, really sick. And, and quite often people who have chronic kidney disease, they never knew they had anything wrong with them. They, they, they started feeling like crap. So they finally went to a doctor, right? And the doctor said, Hey, you know, you're type two diabetic, man. Uh, and you got like some blood pressure problems and you're, you're obese. And your, your blood work showed some funny numbers too. I need you to go to a nephrologist. So I go to, after finding out I'm obese and diabetic, right? I, I go to the like nephrologist, maybe same day sometimes, or maybe, you know, shortly after. And, and I go to the nephrologist and they go like, hey, you also have ESRD. You need dialysis Monday, right? Like, so, so there's different scenarios out there. I, like. I, I hope it's the first one, so at least there's that chance to stop things, right? When the doctor said, hey, you're getting too fat, man, like do something about it. When they, when they say your blood sugar is too high or too whatever, fluctuating, like do something about it. Or they say your blood pressure, like, you know, leave your girlfriend or your, your boyfriend or you know, quit your job or whatever, because your blood pressure is too high. Like, do something about it. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if you have those luxuries, right? Like, not really. <laughs> Take some medicine. <laughs> but but those two things are manage manageable, guys. Like, type 2 diabetes and hypertension, you can stop the damage. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm type 2 diabetic, so I'm going to have to go on dialysis. Not true. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit more about these one in seven Americans. Like, if you had to say, like, the, the, the group with the biggest, like, the highest numbers, and, and we're going to be, like, the, the racial thing right now, right? The, the, what race do you think has the highest numbers? Of diabetes. Of of. CKD and type 2 diabetes and hypertension too. Just Americans in general. <laughs> so, so what what color? Like Hispanic, Latino, black, white? We're starting uh, to eat all the same things, if you know what I mean. I, I, I do know what you mean, but <laughs> it's not the same though. It's genetic? No. It's the... It's mm. the, it's the culture i mean culture related yeah so so it's 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 black and hispanic the number the, the top yeah. uh like the top numbers for ckd type 2 oh. diabetes and hypertension 
Okay, let's oh. let's now like dive in a little bit on that. Um, that's not like just uh, uh, we eat the same thing. That's like where do they live? That's true. Like they live somewhere where there's a liquor store on every corner. There's more fast food than grocery store. The grocery store is like you know a uh, uh, bootleg grocery store, right? Not, <laughs> no, no Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or stuff like that, right? The parks are not safe to play in. And uh, cheap, um, cheap food is mostly sugar. <laughs> the, the high school graduation rates are lower. The college uh, degrees are, you know, percentages are lower. Health literacy is lower. Healthcare insurance is lower. Like, think about it, guys. That that's an environment. You know, what I mean, and and maybe some of us live in those environments. I don't know. So so we could also be, you know, kind of subordinate to it. Like if you grow up in an environment, it's it's pretty hard to not absorb some of it, mm -hmm. right? If if you live in a a, a black or Af uh, Hispanic Latino American uh, Latino um, household, you probably live in a multi house multi family household as well. So you probably don't sleep as much, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, and then when it comes time to eat, there's a lot of carbohydrate. To spread it out right and, and i know filipino you guys know that story right like hey mm -hmm. like th this is kind of either how you knew it or you've heard of people having it in the philippines is that like they can make a meal out of rice and just a little bit of something yeah mm -hmm. right? so so the carb the carb index goes up and it's if that's what you <laughs> yeah if, if that's what you're taking in then you're you're uh you're destined for problems, right? So, so I just want to point out that, like, in the United States and around the world, that disparity drives, like, like health burden. You know, when when people are poor, that there's there's a higher health burden on them. They're the ones who are sick. They're the ones who cost a lot of money to take care of from the government. So it's it's. You know, we can like sit here and scratch our our head or our butt all day, but it's like, well, how do we how do we lower these numbers? Duh. Right? Like invest in those communities, invest in education into those communities so that they know um so that they have options for eating, that they understand the importance that they have like health literacy, right? The importance of seeing a doctor at least once a year. Like I told you, a Latino man won't do that. That's like you—you you go ask your friends, like if if they're Latino, like older men especially. Like, how often do you see a doctor? Never. <laughs> I saw him like 15 years ago, right? When I broke my whatever, <laughs> something like that. So, so with with these stages, like I said, um, one one through four, you don't you don't need dialysis. But stage five, you need dialysis. And and here's here's the kicker. Like in the United States, who pays for dialysis? The government. Yeah. Healthcare. The government. Medical. So, Medicare. Medicare. <laughs> Medicare, Medical. That's right. Centers for Medicare, Medicaid services. But when do they pay for it? Like as soon as you find out you have chronic kidney disease or when you need dialysis? When you need the dialysis. Yeah, only at the last part. Like again, like we can sit here and scratch our head and our butt all day long and go like, hey, how do we do something about this? Like, <laughs> but like, the, what do we do? We wait till it's too late. We treat them when they're a train wreck. Yeah. You know? What what is really needed is in stage one through four that we go like, hey, uh, David, you know, like we 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 really got to get this under control. Like this is this is what progress looks like, and you don't want to see progress, man. You don't want to end up sitting in this damn center. Like like we got to get some tough like tough love ahead of people, right? Um, upstream, yes. 
and and hopefully they never ever need you guys. That, that's that's what what the hope is. They never need dialysis, right? So as a dialysis tech or a dialysis nurse, like my hope is that you know we start to see a change in the numbers. There's definitely a shortage of us. Like if we could just bring the numbers down, so there's enough of us. Good job. <laughs> good job. Um, so, so when the kidneys fail to that point, you need dialysis or transplant, or it becomes a terminal illness. How long will they live? I don't know. That depends, right? Like somebody's 89 years old and they've, they've got two legs missing already and they're on a ventilator and they got an active infection and an open wound. Like, I, you know, <laughs> a couple minutes, I don't know. <laughs> like, like it could be fast, right? And somebody's 20 years old and just says, you know what, screw this. I don't want to do dialysis. I'm just going to let it work its course. Like that guy might be alive for like three months, four months, even longer. So dialysis doesn't guarantee you any time, right? It just offers some replacement value to, to what your kidneys used to do. And, and there's, the, the, the treatment is, like I said, dialysis, that it, it can do some things, but not all things that the kidneys used to do. The, the kidneys, like, they, 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 they accomplish a balance in your blood by making urine and excreting things like excess fluid, toxins, and acids, and waste. But then the kidneys also have a responsibility in converting or making hormones or messengers, messengers in your body that are responsible for like making red blood cells or stimulating red blood cell production um, or uh, absorbing calcium in your gut or uh, absorbing sodium into your blood. So, so these hormones, the nurses can't replace that. Like the nurses have to give patients medications when they come in to replace those things. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I got like a little. I'm. I don't feel sick, but I got a cough. <laughs> Good thing we're not face to face, right? <laughs> I hope you're okay, man. So the things that are needed for dialysis are, well, your kidneys. What do they do? They they process blood all day long. So. If we're going to replace the function of the kidneys, we got to be able to process blood too, and we need access to it. So that that's not just going to be like, hey, put a needle in my vein, uh, because the the speed and volume of blood that we need to do dialysis and actually replace functions of the kidneys, uh, a normal vein can't withstand. There's got to be like a surgical uh, alteration to your vein or a tube put into your body, like a catheter. Um, or if it's the other kind of dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, uh, catheter in their abdomen. So some sort of access to blood, okay? And then there's there's a got to be a filter or, or a semi-permeable membrane, something that is going to uh, uh, allow us to, when we have access to that blood, to then take a specially formulated solution called dialysate and, and run it across on the other side of the membrane. <laughs> then there's some magic that happens, right? Like um, when you separate two solutions um, with a membrane, things can move through that membrane because it's porous and it will move towards making the blood and the dialysate equal. So the dialysate is like a, a manipulator of blood. Okay? Three things to do dialysis. Again, access to blood, uh, permeable membrane, and uh, dialysis. I'm not sure who's got like some background. Um, I think that's me. I'm going to mute you. Yep. Better. <coughs> So like I said, there's this type of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis that patients can uh, do dialysis at home with their like self-care, no needles, no blood coming out of their body. They've got this catheter that's put into their abdomen and then 
their abdomen acts as a membrane. It's called the peritoneum. Um, peritoneum is basically like a lining of your abdomen, and and the lining is made up of blood vessels. So blood vessels have blood inside of them, right? And then the vessel itself is a like a filter, like a membrane. And then the patient will fill a solution into that that space called the perit uh, peritoneal cavity. So they'll fill this solution, the dialysate in there, and then they'll disconnect and they'll just go like walk around and do their work or write their book or study or whatever it is they got to do for maybe three hours or four hours. And then they'll come back to a clean room and they'll connect this catheter to a bag on the ground and they'll drain that fluid out and then they'll fill it back up. And that's called an exchange. So they'll do that several times a day, like drain that fluid out, put in fresh fluid. What happens is when that fluid is sitting inside of the abdomen or that peritoneal cavity, separated by blood vessels from blood, again, there's some magic. Like the, the blood and the dialysate move towards equilibrium. They move towards being equal in concentrations. So the, the dialysate, eventually will be like equilibrated with blood. It needs to be drained out and then fresh dialysate put in again so it continues to change the blood and improve the values. Peritoneal dialysis is like an all day thing every day. It's, it's not uh, like hemodialysis where you come in on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. It's every day, all day. It's like going pee, but it takes a half hour. Okay, like for the exchange, takes about a half hour. But it offers like you can, you're free, right? You can go to work, you can, uh, or stay working. You don't have to lose your job, right? Because you end up at dialysis on those days and feeling like crap after dialysis. And because it's every day, all day, the patient feels much better, much more stable, much more baseline. Um, it has risk of infection because there's a catheter involved. And, and it does require like somebody to do for themselves, right? Which that's a good thing, but some people might not see it that way. Some people just want to go to the center and stick their arm out and go like, take care of me, right? Um, I, I hope that's, you know, you can encourage people to take things into their own hands. And this is one of those options, right? So like when, they're, when they learn that they have kidney failure and they need dialysis, this should be presented as an option. Sometimes it's not like the first available surgery they can get. So they may need hemodialysis for a short period of time. Um, but this should be an option. It frees up the healthcare system, right? Like nobody needs to take care of this person. It gets the person back into their, their um, like feeling dignity again or, or, or without a loss of dignity. And, and from uh, economics, like somebody working is better for everything. Like they, they have probably employer-based health care uh, uh, plans that pay very well for the dialysis treatment. So the provider will like that. And then also they're going to pay taxes, right? Which is, which is good for the country. So the economics like of keeping somebody doing dialysis at home is it's just good business for the country. Is good business for the patient. Is good business for the provider. Hemodialysis, uh, same three things are required: the the access, but we typically put needles into things called graft or fistulas, and you guys will do that, right? You guys are going to be the ones putting needles in. Um, the technicians do that duty, so you have like a phlebotomy um, crossover, right? Kind of a hybrid. You, you're not a phlebotomist, by the way. You're not going to be able to do that. But um, as far as a dialysis patient is concerned, you perform all the phlebotomy. You put the needles in, you set up like the vacutainers and the adapters and the, the specimens and have to handle the specimens and all that kind of stuff. Oops, sorry. Went away. Oh, I already threw up those, those uh, arrows. Sorry. Um, so the membrane is this little canister. It's called a dialyzer. And um, inside of the, the classroom that you guys have, there'll be a really good 3D model of the dialyzer when we talk about it. But um, the, the dialyzer is 
where that magic happens. There's like hollow fibers. They're, they're like the size of a, a strand of hair and blood is running inside of those hollow fibers. And then around those hollow fibers, dialysate is running and, and, and they're both contained inside of that dialyzer running in opposite directions. So, so during treatment, like the patient's blood comes out of their body, runs through that dialyzer, but so does dialysate, uh, another solution, right? They're both running through that dialyzer very quickly. So blood, membrane, and dialysate, three things needed for uh, dialysis. We're going to skip over that. So history, like dialyzer and machine-wise, this, this is a Derek, right? <laughs> uh, 1943, and there's like a lot of, I don't I don't dive into these weeds too much because it doesn't really matter um, like when, what was the date, but somewhere in 1943, 1945, there was the documentation of the, the first successful hemodialysis treatment by Dr. Willem Kolf. Happened in the Netherlands. <clears throat> he was a Nazi defector. It was during the time of World War. Um, World War II, right? So that just a, a, a lot going on for somebody to be developing a machine like this right in the middle of it. But as far as like its technology, it's it's just a, a bathtub <laughs> with a bingo wheel in the middle of it. And like that bingo wheel would spin around and it's it had a sausage casing, literally a sausage casing that was the membrane. So the blood would be inside the sausage casing, and then the, that sausage casing would be bathing inside of a bath of dialysate. Basic science. When you put two solutions separated by a membrane, they're going to equilibrate. That's all you need to know. <laughs> That's how dialysis started, man. Like, it was simple. Okay? Today, we know a lot more that, like, we've got to look for air in the blood and stuff. Like, we can introduce air, and then, like, sausage casing is probably not the best thing to be using as a membrane and you know we we understand the dynamics like how fluid behaves you know much more than we did back then uh, but this thing made like save somebody and kept somebody alive for a short period of time as the first hemodialysis treatment somebody was in a, a uremic coma um and during the treatment came out of the coma and I, i'm not sure how many times he dialyzed that patient but um, it, there is documentation that says that the patient died a short time after. <clears throat> so first one down, right? That's just a science experiment, guys. That's not anything that Medicare or your insurance is going to pay for. So in 1943 or 45 or 48 or 50 or 55 or 60, like you had kidney failure and you wanted dialysis, you had to what? Pay for it. <clears throat> and you had to be lucky enough to be at a spot where it was at and be picked by this committee of people who said, like, you, you know, we pick you to live and everybody else go home and die. <clears throat> so to do the treatment, it was actually a challenge in the early uh, in the early days where getting access to blood, they, they didn't have that figured out. They were doing actual surgeries and cut downs, dissections. To arteries and veins and basically after one time then they they'd have to sew up suture up and then go to another place the next time and after 10 to 12 times there were no more places to be no more places to tap into so if you were getting dialysis <clears throat> after like 10 12 times when there's no more spots to create an access or get access then it was just like okay sorry we can't do it anymore now what? You go home and die, right? <clears throat> that was what was going to happen. But what happened in like the Korean War, which I believe is 50 to 53, so American soldiers that were um, experiencing acute kidney injuries as a result of like uh, blood loss um, or infection or things like this were being treated in the field and they found that sometimes with acute kidney injury, that the, the kidneys would actually recover if you gave the patient dialysis and treated whatever injuries they had. 
So some of the soldiers had kidney injury, they got dialysis for a while, and then they recovered. That's promising. You know, if we're doing science experiments, right, and we start to see something like this, this is interesting. Let's learn more, right, for sure. So, so when, when, when that kind of stuff happens in science, like people put money into it, right? And, and there became funding, um, research, development from the federal government, mainly in uh, graduate, graduate, not graduate, um, doctorate uh, studies, PhD students. So these 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 programs start to develop as a result of curiosity, as a result of progress. And and in the 60s, like, hey, somebody figured out the access thing. No more 10 to 12 times. This guy Belding Scribner, he's really a respected nephrologist um, from uh, Seattle, Washington, that that developed the first what they call a Scribner shunt. And it was kind of like a catheter in your arm that made it possible to do dialysis for years. The, patient, the first patient who got that uh, lived till 1971. He got it in 1960, right? So 11 years. And then in 1966, the two doctors one up them and, and they, they develop uh, uh, access that is our gold standard today called a fistula, where they, they surgically anastomose or join together, connect an artery and a vein peripherally, like in the arm or the leg, so that the vein will share the arterial pressure and basically like a bodybuilder, like the vein would get much bigger. A fistula, a, a fistula can get really kind of ugly. In fact, it can look like a snake in somebody's arm or like another arm on their arm. Yeah. So things are progressing. Again, dialyzers start to become reusable instead of part of the, like the, the equipment, right? And, and sausage casing, cellophane <clears throat> um, sheets that were... Um, like spaced and and uh, squeezed into these sandwich boards called keel dialyzers. These things could be taken apart and rebuilt for reuse. Took a couple hours. It was maybe very laborious um, to run dialysis in the initial days. Like the 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 technical staff had to do, do a lot of stuff. Had to use tools. Right. Had to be kind of like. Um, uh, what's the right word? Like uh, kind of hands-on uh, or uh, in, uh, in, ingenuity, right? Like, let me see, how, how can I make this work? That kind of stuff. Um, dialyzer started to change, and, and we went through a dialyzer called a coil dialyzer, and then a flat plate dialyzer, and then we got to the ones that, like what we have today, hollow fiber dialyzers that would be like 10 to 15,000 strands called hollow fibers in there, and they're about the size of your hair, but they're hollow and they're porous as well. So they, if blood is running inside of them, things can pass in and out of the pores. Um, they they, they um, had different materials that we went through as well. So we had like natural materials like cellulosic and then modified cellulosis and then plastics and and we'll talk about that down the road as well, like how different material has an effect on the treatment as far as biocompatibility, like a person's reaction to those membranes. And and as things go on again, like who's going to pay for this stuff? It's experimental. It's a science experiment. But man, things are looking good, right? Like by this time, by the sixties, things are much better than they were in the 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 forties. And it's looking like this stuff can keep people alive, but it's yeah. There were research centers, and and um, they had federal funding grants. They were far and few. First one is was in Seattle, Washington, and basically like that. You know, they'll have so many openings, right? So many, so many seats. 
so many beds to do dialysis. And then they'll have people that would come there and they would have the money for it. And they gotta, they'd have to have, um, in the 60s, $10,000 for each year of treatment and have three years up front. <clears throat> so they have to have $30,000. Today's 2021, and that will be very difficult for most people. Most people, right? Even with cost of living, inflation, all that, like wage increases, it's going to be very hard. The thing about the 60s, who could pay for dialysis? Like, not many people. And then, you know, you can go down the rabbit hole and be like, well, let's think about it. In the 60s, there was like civil rights and really a lot of inequality in the United States. And probably the people who could pay for it were rich white men, right? To get dialysis in those days. And then they, if even if they could pay for it, they got to sit before a committee of people that were supposed to be their peers. And then those peers would say, okay, out of you four, we think that um, Ed Rev is the, the one who should get the chair. Sorry, the rest of you. <clears throat> the, the choice was really who lives and who dies, right? So they had to look at things. They were supposed to be objective. They had to look at like, you know, how old and how sick. <clears throat> Older and sicker is going to be lower on the list. Lower on the priority. They, they, they have like cut off for like 45 years of age. <clears throat> Can you imagine? We won't have many patients if we still did that. Most of our patients above that age. <clears throat> if they had uh, mental problems or emotional problems, which and first of all, who, who wouldn't have a mental problem or emotional problem if they had kidney failure? Like, you're going to be upset. You're going to be probably depressed. You're going to be questioning life and purpose and relationships and all that kind of stuff, right? And then contribution to society. What? Like, what's that mean? <laughs> like, my contribution to society is I'm creative, right? I, I like... I make music, I, I, I make art, um, I write uh, inspirational whatever. Uh, my contribution is that I am raising a family. My contribution is that uh, I open a business. My contribution is that I am just, I, I am, <laughs> you know? Like, who's to say that you're making contribution to society? Well, they had to make that determination. So then you go like, okay, sitting before you is uh, a homemaker. She's got $30,000. And then the second contestant is a NASA scientist or, uh, you know, something like, you know, a, an engineer. Like, who, who says that the scientist, the engineer is more valuable than homemaker? But who do you think would probably be picked in that from that objective perspective? And then again, do they have financial resources? So this is just a tough, a tough game. <clears throat> Rich white men, robots. <laughs> yeah, robots would would get the seat. So I want you guys to write this down and look it up on YouTube. It's called "Who Shall Live." Who shall live? That's the video name. Who shall live? It's from like 1964 or 65 documentary. You'll see what I mean. Um, it'll follow. Please watch the whole thing. It's about an hour, okay? It's boring because it's from 1965. <laughs> um, but just try and try and try and make it intimate, you know? Try and make it like something that happened today. It's, it's 1965, it doesn't happen anymore, but just imagine it did. And it, imagine it was 
like people you know, people on your street, you know, people in your work. Because you're going to see stories of like a milkman. I know it sounds funny, like milkman, right? A uh, milkman, a homemaker, a retired Navy guy, and um, I can't remember what, maybe a machinist. People who actually went through the death committee, the life or death committee, some who got dialysis and some who did not. <clears throat> so in 1972, and there was an uh, initiative to have the government take over the burden financially to, to get people dialysis who need it. Not have pay, patients pay for it, but have the government pay for it. And, and man, it was, it's crazy the way that it, it, it came out because a senator like claimed that the patients who, who, uh, needed dialysis that basically 100% of them could still go back to work if they just get dialysis. But, but what, what they did not consider is that when, if, if everybody who needs dialysis can get dialysis, right, then it's not just these people, like the people who are young and healthier, it's going to be the older and the sicker and the mentally unstable and the cripple and, and things like that, right? So now today, after this law was enacted, so the, we had an end-stage renal disease program entitlement with Medicare. Since then, most patients don't work. One, maybe they're already of an age where they were retired already. But two, dialysis is almost debilitating because you got to go to a center at a certain time and try and run a marathon in four hours. Like your kidneys are supposed to do that stuff all day long, every day. And you're going to try and replace the functions of the kidneys in four hours. That's like literally like trying to run a marathon in world-class time. Your body can't take it. You get beat up. You're tired. When you go home, you don't want to go to work. You want to go to sleep and try and start over tomorrow. <clears throat> That's like typical to a person that is getting dialysis in the center. Okay, so when, when Medicare started paying for this, yeah, it opened the doors for everybody. And when I say Medicare, it's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. It, it was passed in 1972 and acted in 1973. So from that time on, if you had CKD5, ESRD, um, you could uh, apply for Medicare and you would qualify for Medicare benefits. If you, if you don't qualify for Medicare, it's because of your documentation, right? Then you will qualify for a Medicaid program, which is a state-funded program. And, and when, when, you when you qualify for Medicare, you would have 80% paid for Medicare, 20% paid for from Medi-Cal or Medicaid. If you don't have Medicare, then Medi-Cal will be the only payment or Medicaid would be the only payment to the dialysis provider. And let me tell you, there are some states that don't have Medicaid. So if there's no Medicaid, like we still have to treat patients. Somebody got to pay for it. There are funds for that out there. Okay. There are funds for that out there. And, and there are people that come from all around the world, like on, on, the, uh, on the, the quest to get to the United States because they know their kidneys are failing or have failed. And if they get here, they will get care. So, so it's, it's like one of, th this is one of those programs that should make you feel good about being in America or being an American or just about the, the country's politics as a whole, that we actually have something like this. You know, it's coverage for everybody. That's not true of everything though, guys. If you have heart disease or cancer, do you qualify for Medicare? No. No. So it's, it's, it's almost discriminating, right? This is weird. Like if you have kidney failure, you get Medicare, but anything else that's like, you know, kills a lot more people, um, nope, you're not covered. 
unless you're permanently disabled or 65 plus. So three things qualify you for Medicare, permanently disabled, 65 years or older, or ESRD. Special, right? This, this industry, CKD, over 100 billion with a B dollars a year from Medicare. It's a massive expenditure. Like, really, like, is, is <clears throat> as blessed as you all are going to be to be in this industry. You know, as you grow, who knows what you do and how it benefits you and your families. Um, we, we just, we're, we're out of control on this one. This is one that we should be like, just like we had COVID testing, we should be having like CKD testing <laughs> all over the damn country, figuring out who's got this stuff and start to take measures now. Because any day the switches can flip and the floodgates will open of people who qualify as CKD-5. There are so many people in this country that have CKD-1 through 4. So many. So before Medicare paid for stuff, this is interesting. When people had to pay for it and, they, and there was no spots in the hospital, they were willing to do it at home. They would pay for it and do it at home themselves. Can you imagine? Like, hey, come to the hospital. We'll do it for you. We're going to charge you 10 grand. And actually, you know what? You can't come to the hospital. We don't have spots, but you can do it at home yourself. And still give us 10 grand. <laughs> Um, and same thing today, patients that go home, the provider still gets paid for it, right? But 40% of the patients that were on dialysis before Medicare were doing that at home. Today, that number is like 13%. Why? Because our patients are older, sicker, and also there's, there's capitalism in play. Like if I have dialysis centers where I can bring, you know, 100 people, 200 people in a dialysis center a day, yeah, I'm going to try and fill it up. I'm not going to tell you to do it at home. Tell you come to my center and, you know, be like a cattle, right? Like, come on in, and get on out, and let me get the next one in and the next one out. Like, that's that's what happens from these companies sometimes. Now, now I'm giving you like a harsh reality, guys, okay? But, of course, you guys cannot treat people as cattle, right? You, you, your, your focus is not throughput. Your focus is like the, the quality in every encounter that that goes from a safety and effectiveness but also from the personal touch right like people don't feel rushed they don't feel like a number they don't feel like a patient they feel like their needs are attended to they're they're the center of attention um that they're getting their questions answered and the education they need to be able to take care of themselves if they choose to do so <clears throat> but yeah 40 percent we're doing it before after more machines, more clinics, everybody started going to dialysis centers. It was a lucrative business. Okay. Like I said, over 100 billion in CKD alone. In ESRD, 37 billion just in the dialysis side of things, CKD5 things. So reimbursements kind of, they, they've moved slowly um, in dialysis. And and as slow as, as slow as they have moved, um, it's probably a good thing because people we've complained about payments for years. But like I said, look at the total expenditures out there. Can you imagine if we had our way? Like if we had our way, as the providers, like the the businesses, it wouldn't be thirty seven billion dollars a year just for ESRD. It'd be like a hundred billion dollars a year for ESRD, right? We'd be charging up up the rear end, um, but Medicare has been really slow on changing payments. From 1972, kept the same payment mechanism till 1983. It was actually beneficial because it was called a cost plus. It was kind of like investing and guaranteeing you're going to get a percentage return. Um, and then in 1983, they said, "Hey, you guys are making too much money, so so we're going to control the cost in a certain area, create a composite fixed rate for the treatment." but go ahead and keep charging for medications. So guess what the dialysis centers did? They they started giving more medications. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
<laughs> like just I'm gonna be honest with you guys, like how things work. Okay, you gotta you gotta know. Um, and 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 if you go look in uh, Google, just look up uh, whistleblower lawsuits in dialysis. Man, we we have paid more money than any, any other industry when it comes to whistleblower lawsuits. These companies, the Vita, Presenius, they just lie and cheat and steal money every chance they can get, right? Like honestly, they they save they put money in the bank just for when they get caught. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're already they're planning on getting caught and having to pay for it. That's how they <laughs> that's how they do business. That's a publicly traded company, both of them, right? So it's stockholders that own the 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 companies and and they push for returns. Warren Buffett is a big dialysis player. You know, one of the gurus of investments in this in this the, the last century, right? Um, so so in in the latest adjustments, again, Medicare said you guys make way too much money because like your CEOs, they make like thirty million dollars a year, <laughs> like the Vita for senior CEOs, right? They make these massive, scary amounts of money. They might as well be rappers, right? <laughs> they, they're making that kind of money, um, like they're selling millions of records. Um, and, and Medicare said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Medicare pulled back and said, everything that you do that is related to kidney failure, so dialysis, blood work, medications, you're just going to get paid one payment, a bundle. That's it. You can't get more. You, you can get less if you get penalized for something, but you're not going to get more. So go ahead and give all the medication you want. You're paying for it. We're not giving you any more money than what, what it is, the bundle, right? Go ahead and draw all the blood you want. And, 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 and then Medicare said, not only is it a bundled payment, but we're going to set a bunch of rules. Like you have to meet these metrics. <laughs> On every patient, you got to have their anemia under control, their bone mineral disease under control the adequacy of treatment, their infection rates, their hospitalization, their mortality rates. You got to have them all under control. And if you don't get those numbers from that bundled payment, we're going to take some back. <laughs> That's how Medicare did it, which is cool. So they said, they said, Medicare said, we want you to do more with less. As far as payment goes, Medicare in 2011 forced the dialysis industry to do more with less. And it worked. Our, our outcomes improved. <laughs> Hospitalization, all-cause mortality, uh, uh, myocardial infarctions, and things like this. Everything improved. So Medicare was on the right track. And, and they continue to scrutinize our industry when it comes to reimbursement because there's just too many people that are in this pot. Even if you're just paying a little bit of money because of the volume of people that get dialysis and have CKD, you know, pennies mean a lot, right? When we're talking about, you know, a million or when we're talking about 37 million in the United States, like people who have CKD. So Medicare is like, um, taken on this huge burden. Our government has taken on this huge burden now. And and they, they they are paying for this. They want to make sure that people are, you know, that they're getting the return on investment, if you will, that people are are being taken care of, safe and effective, but also that, you know, as they can kind of model out that people are also rehabilitating, right? That people are getting back to work paying some taxes and writing some books and making some businesses and stuff like that. So, so that's part of it. Like, what did we say the other day? We dialyze people so they can live. So that's what Medicare expects. And, and Medicare can't keep an eye on all this stuff. They just don't have the manpower. So they, they contracted out to these groups called ESRD networks that there's 18 across the country and they have different regions. And they, they do things like promote rehabilitation. So they'll have workshops and one-on-ones in clinics and interactions with patients. They will gather data from their region on things like 
the demographics to, um, you know, it, within the demographics, like the average household incomes or how many people working or, or, or things like this, right? Um, they will handle grievances for patients when they feel like they are being discriminated or um, that their rights have been violated um, in the clinic. Um, the ESRD network's gonna act as like mediaries and then they can they can sponsor and and uh, promote quality improvement projects in the region. Like if we know that, let's say there's you know it's hurricane season or it's tornado season or whatever, they they might do projects that are around like emergency preparedness in that region. Um, or if in our region we're kind of scoring lower with infection control, or we have like Legionnaire or Legionnaire's disease going around in our water. They might do something around that, you know? So specific to their region, advocates between the patients, the clinics, and Medicare. In Southern California, we're ESRD Network 18. And you'll notice something that California has two just in one state. And that's because we have so many black and brown, right? Our, our ethnicity, our melting pot, it, like we're the heaviest populated state, right? And we have the the highest um, rate, like ethnic um, mix. When you look at other states that are like at par with us, it would be like Texas and Florida. Of course, New York, New Jersey, right there as well. Quality and dialysis is going to be a, a huge focus for everybody. It's it should be a culture. It should be like you know the expectation the the carrot before the rabbit, um, the, the, the promise and the delivery. And, and it, when we say what's quality, it's like, yeah, it's, safe, it's supposed to be safe and effective and be focused on number one, who's the patient, not you. Um, timely, like if they got appointments, do your best to meet those appointments. And sometimes that means move, move your butt, right? You might have to hustle a little bit. Um, and, 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 and I'm not saying ever take a shortcut, but you might have to move your body. I, I say that, move your hands, move your body fast, okay? Efficient, like you know what you need, you get those, those things ready. You don't have to go back and forth for stuff, right? Like you, you follow a process that is one step instead of two. Not cutting out a step, but taking only the steps that are, are necessary so that efficiency, okay? So, and that's gonna be part of your timeliness as well. If you're not efficient, you're not gonna be on time with your, with your, your appointments for your patients. Uh, equitable, it right? doesn't matter what color, what age, what sex or orientation or identification or religion or sports team or who they voted for in, in the Philippines or the US, um, like doesn't matter, right? It, it, you treat them with the highest level of respect and courtesy. That's their right. You don't have to like them. They don't have to respect you. You have to respect them. Okay. So if you had to pick just one, or let me give you two, pick two. Most important two. What do you say, Ed Rev? Hmm, that's a hard one. Um, but I guess uh, I will go with safe and patient centered. Safe and patient centered. How about you, David? Yeah, safe and being efficient. Okay. And then Rose? Safe and timely. Timely, okay. And then Mimi? Effective and patient-centered. Effective and patient-centered, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so like, th they're all important. These are like lined up from the Institute of Medicine um, as the framework of quality, but they're all important, equally important. But I, I ask you like which two, because it, it, it kind of, you, you want to lean towards something and, and it, it kind of says, 
who you are and where your stake is in the game. Like if you said safe, that's a very technical practitioner, nurse, doctor, technician type of answer. Okay. If you said effective, same thing, very technician, nurse, doctor type of answer. Patient centered, guess who? Patient, right? Or family. Timely, patient, family. Efficient, managers. And like society. Like if I if I'm paying for this stuff, which I am, and so are you. I want to make sure that dialysis clinics are good stewards of my money and maximize its reach, right? And then equitable, same thing, society, voters, patients. I don't want you to treat me different. Or I better yet, I don't want you to treat me worse than anybody. If you're gonna treat me different, treat me better. <laughs> but but it shouldn't be because of my color, my 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 sex or my sexual orientation or identification or the way I vote or the way I gamble or whatever it is, right? It, it should just be because I'm a, a human being. That's good enough. So when it, when it comes to equality from, from like a, a governing body, there are rules. <laughs> it's not just like safe and effective like there. It's like, what's safe? What's effective? <laughs> what's patient-centered, right? And what, what, what's uh, keeping an appointment? Like all those things are laid out. We, we get surveyed. We get audited. We get put under the microscope by Medicare or by the Department of Public Health. And they use these tools to, to hold us against the rules, the conditions for coverage, they call it. That's the rules, okay? And if we don't, if we're not meeting those rules, then they'll write us up. They'll give us a, a bad report card, right? It's public, public, uh, like public um, domain. Like the public can see that stuff, and then when they write us up, they'll tell us like, fix this, fix this, fix this. Then we got to write up a plan that satisfies the Department of Public Health or Medicare. Like, here's what we're going to do about the first problem. Here's what we're going to do about the second one. Here's what we're going to do about the third one. And then we got to do that plan, but. They got to accept our plan. Okay, so uh, a statement of deficiencies, they give us a statement of deficiencies, then we give them a plan of correction. And if we can't satisfy them, sometimes even on the spot, this can happen, but they can take away our certification, our funding, our ability to get paid from Medicare. So if you're not doing it the way Medicare says you're supposed to do it, they'll just say, fine, you can't get paid from us. And typically, they send the Department of Public Health out to do this for them. So the Department of Public Health actually also represents the state, which licenses the clinic. So if you can't get paid from Medicare, okay, fine, I got a lot of patients who just, they, they're private pay or they're commercial insurance. That's fine. I can do dialysis still. But then the state pulls your license, you can't do that either. So those rules, they apply from Medicare, but then the state usually adopts most of those rules as well within their licensing process. If you work in a hospital or a nursing home, they might get additional accreditations from a group called the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare uh, Organizations, or JACO. Um, it's a, it's a, just another another group that's going to come observe you and and by passing their survey you you can keep something called an accreditation it's like a higher level of credentialing or um credibility for a hospital or a nursing home and then dialysis centers have to abide by standards that are written by a group called amy because we do things like Water treatment, we, we treat the water for hemodialysis purposes. This group, Amy, they wrote all the standards for us in that regard. So they're like the experts, we adopt their standards, okay? And we also do did 
reused dialyzers in the past where like we would use it today and then you know send the patient home and, and clean it up and test it and store it and disinfect it uh, and then use it again on them on Saturday or whatever day they have dialysis again. We don't do that anymore, okay? Uh, and then on dialysate preparation as well. So this group, Amy, we're gonna be talking about them a lot, like towards the end of our, our um, um, online time when we talk about water treatment, okay? FDA is involved because we have medical devices, right? The, the machine, the dialyzer, the blood lines, we have medications, all that stuff is cleared through the FDA. So of course we are using devices that are cleared from the FDA. And then if we have problems with those devices, we'll have communication and reporting obligations to the FDA as well. So that if we have a problem and by reporting it, maybe the FDA will recall it, right? Or put out safety information on a device like you know, like remember when the phones were blowing up in people's pockets, like they got to recall the phone, right? So same thing, if there's a problem with dialyzers, then they got to recall those, those dialyzers or medications or, or machine or whatever. And, and then there's just this constant, um, this constant thing. <laughs> uh, I almost want to say, be careful about never being satisfied but like it's it's the way we got to live we can't be satisfied we, we 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 need to shoot for better right and when it comes to safety and quality that that's not a thing that will like you know i can't live my life i, I i'm just going to be satisfied no you always got to be looking for better you always got to be looking for a problem that's not there like how do you fix that problem? So we improve quality by measuring things, right? By measuring things, we can see like trends in doing better or doing worse. We can learn from the way that we're doing things to get those trends. So like if we're getting great numbers or we have an improvement in numbers, we look at what our practice is. We probably document that practice and, and make it a best practice. And, and then we may share that with others so that it can become like a guideline in the industry. And there are different groups that write guidelines for us, um, groups like the National Kidney Foundation and the National or the Renal Physicians Association. But, but guidelines are just guidelines. They're not like the Bible or, you know, they're not like uh, 100%, they, 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 they change. And since I've been in dialysis, which is a decent amount of time, but it doesn't feel like a long time, like I've seen things change drastically. Guidelines change drastically. It means that like you can't you can't say like I know it all. Or you can't say like this is the way we do it, or this is the way we've always done it, when you get told this is the way that we're changing and we're gonna start doing it. Gotta be open to change, right? <clears throat> Renal physician, I'm not gonna dive into this too much, but different groups that can set standards for us, National Kidney Foundation, and Renal Physician Association, they just take subject matter experts and look at diving into specifics, things like with the NKF with like anemia and the adequacy of treatment that we deliver and vascular access. And, and they tell us like, how do we get the best outcomes? You know, they give us guidance on that. Um, like I said, quality, no matter where you work, you, you'll see this, some sort of environment that's like quality improvement, uh, total quality improvement or total quality management or continuous quality improvement or what we call QAPI, quality assessment performance improvement. And, and basically it just says that like we measure those things, right? We, we keep logs and records and we review those on a regular basis probably at least a monthly basis with a team that's focused on quality and quality improvement and and that team should involve basically everybody okay all disciplines not not everybody that works for the company but like a representative of a nurse a doctor a social worker dietitian that are actually working the operation 
um, and and it can be um, suggestions and and guidance from the top, from the C-suite, like the C CEO, or it can be suggestions and guidance from the housekeeper. Um, but that's that's a culture, like an open door culture, that is necessary to really promote quality. And 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 I don't want to say guarantee quality, but but to make sure that it's it's you know top of the list every single day. Um, there there are processes in this, okay, on how to do it, and and I'm not going to dive in these weeds either, all right, because I don't think it's too important, like how to structure a meeting today, <laughs> a, a quality meeting, right? But you know, we we basically identify things that we need to improve. Um, we we take a look at those processes and you know what are the efficiencies and the competencies involved in those those things that we need to improve and then we just try stuff right so we we create a plan we try it we check the results we act on those results we we adjust we go back to planning do check act and it's just this cycle pda cycle that we are we never stop we we, we can be the best performing dialysis clinic in the country and we still run this this program it's not a choice. We have to. Medicare requires it. Okay. The other thing that that I want to point out about this quality process is that because it's required and because it's documented, if we find a problem, we have to do something about it. That's the power of knowledge, right? Is now there's a responsibility. So if we find a problem with water, we have to do something about it. I mean, we have to create a plan of of action we have to run that plan out until there's not a problem anymore and even if it never became a problem of safety with patients or medicare never saw it or the department of public health never saw it when they come in and they actually come into survey us if they see a problem with water they'll say like hey let me see your quality improvement plan <laughs> and then you got to show it to them and then they'll say when did it complete who was involved? Where's the record of in-service or education with staff or patients or whatever you said you're going to do? They can run that whole thing out and hold you accountable for it. You guys will be um, like hands-on with the patients, like front and center every single day, high contact, high uh, like volume of time invested into these people's lives, like 12 hours a week you're with them. Right? They become, they do become family. Um, staff and patients both become family, like your colleagues and your, your patients. And you, you got to keep it pro all the time. Don't waver from that. Don't get comfortable. Don't be like, hey, we're both from the same hometown or we both from, from Carson or, you know, we, we, we both speak this dialect or we both like, you know, New York or don't, don't do it. Don't trust people. Okay, and don't cross any boundaries with people. Don't go looking for love at work. Don't go accepting love at work. <laughs> like it's, a, it's it's one of those worlds, man. I'm telling you, like uh, if if you're like young man, young woman, like most likely, if you don't have boyfriend or girlfriend, you're gonna have like three or four <laughs> pretty soon. Because <laughs> it's like so many like young single people working in dialysis. To tell you the truth. It's a good entry point for people who are like going into nursing and they know that. Um, so you're going to see a lot of like people right out of high school, right in uh, early stages of college, stuff like that, that are, are working as techs um, and, and company, what do you call it? Company uh, team building projects and stuff like that. You might go to like bowling or what do they call it round one or something like that. Or, and they might like you know have an open bar or something like be careful guys like you 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 probably know already like alcohol consumption like letting your hair down around colleagues not the best thing to do if you like to get wild don't do it around colleagues if you like to participate in drinking don't do it around colleagues right and i'm not telling you that a, a moderate and and like one glass of wine that you sip on through the whole night but you don't want to have a change in your head when you're working, when you're around people that you're working with. Um, it, it follows you, right? Like you go back to work and then people talk. Uh, I, I've seen everything, guys. Like 
husband came in and beat up a guy who was messing around with his wife, right? They work together, right? Same thing with a wife come in and do the same thing. <laughs> uh, like I, I've seen it all in the clinic. Don't break the professional boundaries, okay? Um, with staff or patients, and, and you shouldn't, like there's no romance in seeing patients outside of work either, right? You gotta main, maintain those boundaries. You shouldn't be seeing them at the fiesta or at a concert, you know, like go to concert with them or or meeting up for drinks or whatever. That that shouldn't be happening. I actually know like two or three technicians, they met their husband when they were working. <laughs> it's like uh I mean, I can't say no to love like I'm like that, like hey, if you found love, like you found love, right? But um don't go looking for it at work. Okay. And don't go looking for your best friend at work. And don't go looking for your drinking buddy or your bowling buddy or your your biking buddy at work either. Okay, keep it keep it pro 100% of the time. Maintain confidentiality of patients. That's who you're there for. You need to handle their their information carefully so that the wrong people don't get eyes on it or ears on it. You respect them. You treat them with like the uh, and and one of the reasons why I really like to have uh, Filipino students because I don't have to say this one like about how to be polite, right? Like the, the culture is just very polite um, across the board. Even with the, the kids that are born here, I still see they hold the respect um, of the, the Filipino culture. So, you know, Mr. Mrs., um, even though today that can be controversial, right? <laughs> uh, in, in, in what you, how you address people, right? Um, so think about that too, guys. Like be sensitive to that, right? Like. Record says something, patient saying something different. Like, what do you go with? <laughs> right? Like it says, you know, Mr. Jack, you know, Smith, and 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 the patient says, call me Josie. Right? Like, um, you you call them Josie, right? They might not identify the way that they're actually um they're they're assigned, right? Or the way that they're being labeled on their record as well. Um, please, thank you. You're welcome. Like always hundred percent respect and, and dignity to the patient. Make them feel the VIP. If they get moody, just understand it's because they feel comfortable getting moody with you. Lucky you, right? That just means you're 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 cool. <laughs> that just means that you're doing your job to where they, they you you're approachable enough to them that they can vent on you. Right? Hopefully they don't get like belligerent with you and and cuss you out and stuff like that. But even if they do, don't worry about it. You know, don't don't pester them or laugh at them but on the inside know that that might be saving their family from getting yelled at they're going to take it out on you ed rev instead of their wife right lucky you yeah no really so somebody said it the other day it makes you feel good to be doing this right to help people well man if you if you think about every patient's mood that way like when it's a bad one right that you just save their family or their loved ones, you know, their 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 spouse, their kids, their coworkers from having to take the burden of this thing, you know, share the burden. You signed up for it, right? <laughs> right, Ed Rev, you, you signed up for this class. So you, you're willing to take that on. Like, man, you don't sign up for it when your family has kidney failure for all their moods and, you know, it's like, they feel like shit. Like, it's not your fault, right? Like, um, you didn't sign up for that. But but here you guys did, so so take it with with honor. You know, let it make you feel good. Um, but don't let the patient know that. You know, don't let them know that you're drive you you're getting driven from from them cussing you out or because it, it might rub them the wrong way. <laughs> Show up on time. Be a good employee. You know, on time every time. On time if you're if you're on time you're late right. So, so you need to be ready for duty. You start at 9 a.m. You need to be on the floor at 9 a.m. with with you know the, the appropriate clothes on and your 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 hygiene taken care of already, um, and and your bathroom. You know, like you, I just know so many people end up at work and they're like they start to brush their teeth after they clock in in the bathroom, or they go and they you know number two first thing in the morning every day. That's what it is. Well, hey, come in earlier and do it before you before they, you get on the clock, man. <laughs> you can't control it, but some people make their make those routines, 
of like when I get to work, the first thing I'm going to do is clock in. Then I'm going to go sit on the toilet for a half hour. <laughs> don't bring your problems to work, right? Hopefully it's not a stomach problem. <laughs> but don't bring your problems to work. Uh, don't don't uh, like your 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 kids are sick. Your your kids are in jail. Um, your spouse is cheating on you. You're losing your uh, your car is being repossessed. Don't bring that stuff to work, right? Uh, because like they already got a bunch of crap going on. So all of us do, right? We all got stuff. And then and then they got kidney failure too. And guess what? They if if you start sharing stuff with them, if they like you by some odd chance, right? Um, if they like you, then they're gonna want to share that problem with you. They're gonna be like, oh man, Mimi, I'm so sorry you're going through that. You know what? I'm going to church right after this, and I'm going to pray for 24 hours straight. Right? We're going to do a prayer circle too. So after I get relieved, then my sister's going to do it. And like literally, people do that, right? They 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 take on burdens for people that they that they care about, and and that burden can be something from like maybe they start to want to give you money or something, right? Like if you told them you're losing your house, like hey, don't worry, I got it. <laughs> I won the lotto. I'll take care of it. Right, just for this month, you get you guys back on your feet. There's patience like that, man. Um, there's patience when they know that you're going to lose your job or that you you're, you're having problems. We'll go out and pray for you for 24 hours, or or we'll try to speak up and and put their nose in places where it doesn't really belong. Like, hey, I'm going to go talk to your boss. You know, <laughs> I'm going to tell them you need a raise and you need more days, <laughs> or you need to be the boss. Like, they, they need to get out. And you need to be the boss. Right? You don't want that stuff. Right. Share joy. Don't share problems. Okay. So you want to share something, share like the, the good feeling, like when, when you laugh, right? Share that. Euphoria. When, when you when you when you see like a little kid, you know, playing with their puppy, like that kind of share that stuff. Don't share the stuff that you go home and you sit and you think about for two hours and you can't go to sleep. Or that makes your heart beat fast, or like it's gonna do the same thing for your patients. Talk to your patients, include them. Okay, don't don't like go with the pretty one, you know, that like they that like it's it's the brother and sister, and the, the brother's ugly, he's the patient, the sister's the pretty one. So I'm just gonna talk to the sister, you know. No, no, talk to the patient, right? Uh it's it's them. Like when they say, Hey, can you can you can you explain that to my sister? Like she's the one who gets that, right? Yeah, then then go for that. But don't don't like convenience yourself with somebody who's easier to talk to. Sometimes you got patients that every word you say, they I got a question. Hey, I got a question. I got you, or they got like a comparison that has nothing to do with what we're talking about, right? Like, yeah, I used to coach football, and you know, it's like, wait, hold on, football, dialysis access, I don't know, right? Um, but but make it a point to be educated at all times. Make make it a point to be looking for teaching moments. Don't gossip. Patients love to. It's really like a social club dialysis, to tell you the truth. It's it's pretty damn fun. <laughs> if you're like chisme, you know, like you like to get into chisme, right? Then then you're gonna love dialysis center. Because man, just just listen. Don't do it. Just listen. You'll get plenty. I promise. You can make your own soap opera, right? I got a friend. He made a comic book out of chisme. Yeah, it's like it's an ongoing comic book. Um, his name is Dewellen Williams. I'll, I'll I'll share his story with you guys one of these days. But he made a, a comic book because there's so many colorful stories in a Dallas center. Don't shout across the room. Keep it peaceful. You know. The peace and quiet, but then also, what are you shouting? Maybe information that nobody else needs to know, right? So you don't want to like compromise patients' privacy by shouting out their weight or their blood pressure or their blood sugar or anything else, right? Um, and then, as far as language, speak the patient's language to them, but uh, among each other, you need to speak according to the clinic's policy what the common language is which 99% of the time is going to be English. So there have been a lot of issues with language, um, especially in California from 
Spanish and um, different dialect of uh, Filipino speakers, um, like class action lawsuits, equal employment opportunity lawsuits um, because of discrimination. And, and I'm going to say it to you, like I say it to everybody. Um, you worry about yourself. Don't worry about what the other person does. Okay, so you're gonna go into a clinic and I guarantee you somebody's gonna go like, oh, you're Filipino, you speak Tagalog, and then they're gonna go off on you, right? And then I, I need you guys to remember this day that you're gonna answer in English, okay? And you're gonna talk to them in English because they might not like it, right? They might go like, what the hell, snob? I know you speak Tagalog, right? Like you didn't want to talk to me, but you, you know, like people do that to me in Spanish too. Like I want to add, like, they like they want to beat me up, right? Um, but they, they may not like it, but when your boss or somebody from internal sees you answering or speaking in that other language, you could be in some trouble. And and like, I'll tell you the story just quickly. We, we have the internship uh, agreements, right? The clinics, like some of the clinics we've worked with, they will kick people out like first day if they see that, like the students. And it's like the staff did just that. The staff said, hey, you're Filipino? Do you speak Tagalog? Boom. And ruined it for my student. So stay on your toes. Worry about you. Okay? And then speak the language that you have as second, third, fourth, first, whatever language is, when patients need it to them for better communication, better comfort, right? Look the part, take care of yourself, take a shower with soap, you know, do some hygiene, right? If you got hair, comb it, that kind of stuff. Um, scrubs, the right kind of shoes that are not going to, let blood seep through to your sock. So something you can wipe down because you will be, you will have blood on you for sure. There's going to be a day where you're a butcher. You're going to look like it. Peace and quiet. Be ready for your patients for efficiency's sake, right? Nobody wants to wait for you to go back and forth and grab gauze. Keep your area neat and clean. Again, nobody wants to walk into a, a pigsty where they're going to get dialysis for the next four hours. Like I'm going to, if I was a patient, I'm going to be pissed off. If I see stuff on the floor, I'm going to be all over you guys. Like, Hey, pick that up. Like you need to pick that up. <laughs> That's a mess. That's tripping hazard. <laughs> That's infection control. I would not get off the horn. You know, <laughs> It'd be nonstop for me. Outside stuff, no dating, no seeing people, right? You know, that stuff, no romance, no befriending. No loaning or borrowing, no doing work for or getting work from. Like, hey, you fix computers? Okay, come fix my computer. Nope. Or I fix computers, I can fix that. Or, you know, I fix cars. No, don't do that. Even if you got a side business, patient's not your client. Okay. You got one relationship, that's it. You ruined it. You ruined it for the rest of the relationships when you signed up to be a dialysis tech. Okay. You don't get a girlfriend, boyfriend. You don't get a husband, wife. You don't get a mechanic or a, carpenter or somebody that mounts your TVs or somebody spend time with it, except for during dialysis. That's what you sign up for. Um, you, you, you don't bring your problems. You don't, again, accept tips, gifts, money, anything like that. Um, you don't touch people inappropriately, whether it be in a sexual, uh, uh, aggressive, or even in an uninvited or a, unconsented fashion. Like if I'm going to take your blood pressure, you have to consent to it. Like it's it's not just like, well, you're in the center and I'm a tech, so I get to take your blood pressure. No, people get punched for that kind of stuff, right? Like the don't don't invade people's privacy. Um and and always get consent prior to performing any sort of touch or procedure on them. And don't invade their space. Like um I, I say it this way, it's like in the United States, we've got like a three foot personal space. So we typically stand about three feet away from each other. Not every place in the country, in the world is like that. Like, especially like in some of the European countries, when they talk or when they, like they're very close to you. Like if, if they're gonna spit in your face, right? You gotta keep your mouth closed, right? 
because it might get some in your mouth. <laughs> I have a friend, she's uh, one of uh, uh, the board president of Bonnet and she's Italian. And when she, oh my God, when I get close to her, it's just like, or when I see her at our conferences and stuff, like she just closes in the gap and like, I got to put up a, I need a visor, <laughs> you know? So don't, don't close that gap until it's time to perform more like intimate procedures like assessment or um, when I say assessment, gathering data like blood pressure or pulse and things like that. Almost done, guys. Sorry, we're running a little longer than we're scheduled. Um, professionally, I encourage you guys to, to after the, the school, to just find a community where you can get continuing education, um, mentorship, and then um, like a, an organization that's going to really like nurture your, your development. So like, how do you know the next step? How do you know what else is available? How do you know the, the newest best practices? You, you get involved in these sort of groups like NANT. I just was at a conference in Las Vegas two weeks ago for this one. They hold an annual conference and it, it's really great. Um, I'll tell you more stories on our next meeting about this, but I actually um, like my career was catapulted by becoming a member of that group, NAD, N-A-N-T, from being able to write in the textbook that you guys are reading, to being able to write in publications, to getting consulting jobs, to meeting somebody who gave me over $100,000 of equipment, gave me over $100,000 of equipment machines. I met him at that conference and he gave it to me for free. Right. So, so like that, that organization and those events are meant for you guys as technicians to, to find continuing education, mentorship, and find like just peers that are going to help you to develop your career. We also have a uh, CE continuing education uh, community at the school that's a smaller community that we're just starting to build. Um, but you have subscription to be able to do different sort of continuing education events. And I'll share that with you. Same sort of uh, organizations, the Council of Nephrology Nurses and Technicians, that's with National Kidney Foundation, same purpose, okay? And then you will have to be certified. So um, the, the since this slides were developed actually, number three, there is no more, that organization is no more. There's only number one and number two, the Board of Nephrology and the Nephrology Nursing Certification Commission. Those are national certifications. If you guys are gonna work in California, you can take one that's offered in the state, not from those organizations, but from a group called the California Dialysis Council. And that is not a certification, it's a requirement or it meets the requirements for certification. So like once you pass the class, you pass that test, and you get the clinical hours, then you, you can apply with the state for certification. Bonnet and NNCC, when you take those tests, they are a certification in themselves. But again, because you're in California, you're not certified unless you do all three. Pass a test, go to a class, and then um, uh, uh, finish the hours, the, the training hours as well. And you gotta apply to the state, okay? So as we get closer towards our, our lecture end, um, like our, our time together online, I'll, I'll give you the website for the California Dialysis Council and the instructions on how to go about getting certified. So, you know, we went through 44, 45 slides. Thanks for bearing with me, guys. Um, we covered a lot. We pretty much covered the entire module so we can now kind of kick back and just chat next class, okay? And uh, bring up some questions. You guys will watch that video, right? By then, the who shall live, and that'll, I'm sure, trigger a lot of conversation among each other. You'll get into the discussions in that classroom, right? Um, if you guys have not got in that classroom by tomorrow um, afternoon, just message Deneen again, okay? And, and if you need to get on the phone with her, um, walk through getting into the classroom as I showed you today, okay? Um, history and current reimbursement, you know, we discussed in depth. Um, it really set us up for where we're at today as dialysis technicians. Huge shortage of dialysis technicians in this country. 
Um, so you're coming in at a very opportune time. Um, and then since the beginning, we've been in a in a culture and a mindset to to try to improve what we're doing. And and I can say we've we've successfully done that, um, but maybe not at the speed that we could have. Um, there's been a lot of restraint from payment to the the ethos, like the mindset of physicians and prescribing dialysis, like having patients in the center instead of home. Um, so uh, I'm excited to work with you guys. Honestly, I, I, I uh, we're going to see, like have some interesting conversations about the evolution as it's taking place right now from like the 1.0 to the 2.0 dialysis world. Um, you, you guys are going to um, be the first ones in it. So um, any questions or any concerns, please text, email, or call me uh, between now and the next class, okay? Any any questions for tonight? Have a great evening, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thank you, Michael. Good night.